I am honored to uh, be able to introduce to you our main speaker this morning. And uh, two years ago at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in, at the Opryland Hotel in Nashville, uh, Bot Radio Network awarded our speaker the Faith of Our Fathers Award. I have a soft spot in my heart for uh, men and women in ministry that are following along in the footsteps of their parents. And Alan Jackson fits that to a T. He is the pastor of the World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and the host of Alan Jackson Ministries, which you can hear here in Memphis on Bot Radio Network at 10 o'clock in the morning, Monday through Friday, and on the weekend, on also at 8 o'clock in the evening, in case you're busy during the day, and then also Saturdays at 9 a.m. and again on Sunday morning, uh, you want to be sure to tune in. I appreciate his ministry because he ties the Word of God and applies it to what's happening today and how we're living our life. It's not a theoretical ministry. It's a very practical ministry as the Word of God is practical. Well, you see, Pastor Alan Jackson and his wife, Kathy, are here too. Um, his mom and dad started the church as a Bible study, as his dad was a veterinarian, equine veterinarian, working with Tennessee walking horses, and uh, started as a Bible study in their home. And today, under Alan's leadership, it's grown from 30 people to over 15,000 people. And, uh, you know, that's really wonderful that there's so many people, but that's not the, the important thing of his church. It's that they preach the Word of God, and they disciple believers, and they win people to the Lord. Kathy was telling me they've had over 500 baptized already uh, this year, this, this season. So it's just terrific how the Lord has blessed and honored his faithfulness. Uh, despite its current size, he still fondly refers to the congregation as a little country church because that's how it began as a small Bible study back in the 1970s. So, Pastor Alan Jackson, would you please come and uh, speak to us what the Lord has laid on your heart? We're so proud of you and appreciate this new addition to Bot Radio Network. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Wow. Well, hello, Memphis. What an honor to speak to those of you that are providing leadership in this city. Uh, it, it truly is a privilege. Kathy and I drove down um, last evening, uh, very much looking forward, talking about the privilege of coming. Uh, we serve in the same field, but I'm very grateful for your watch over this city. Um, the greatest honor of our lives is bearing the name of Jesus and providing leadership in some form or another to his people. There's nothing else that could be entrusted to you that would have greater value under the sun. Now our culture may not have awakened to that just yet, but that's the truth. So we are honored to be with you and in this beautiful church, Dr. Lawler, what a magnificent place. Thank you for opening the doors and welcoming us. I know that is a sacrifice for your team to do that. Uh, for Bot Radio, what an amazing group of people. Todd, thank you for your leadership here. And Rich and the Bot family, what a heritage. You know, I, I came late in life in ministry to a media ministry. And to be candid, because I didn't really like media ministers. <laughs> My wife's hair wasn't pink. Um, I had some bad attitudes. And, and so one of the highlights for me has been getting to know a bit the Bot family and the integrity they bring to what they do and what they offer to cities across the heartland of our country. And so when they called and asked if I would be a part of this day, I, I quickly said yes, just tell them yes. Whatever they're doing or whatever that looks like, we're in. So I'm grateful that they're in your city and a strength to you and to what you're doing. It's an honor to be here. I wanna start with a prayer, may we do that? Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for your church in the earth. Lord, I thank you that you are the head of the church, that you watch over and direct for your spirit that is present in our midst. Lord, we live in a tumultuous season and we need wisdom beyond ourselves. And I ask today as we have these moments together that you would minister to us far beyond the, the wisdom of any person. 
May we know that the Spirit of God has brought renewed strength to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you've heard, I'm a pastor. It's a little confusing, I think, the story when I hear it told. I've, I've served the same congregation for 40 years, which means I couldn't get but one job. So it's kind of a mixed blessing, I guess. But when I came, there were fewer than 30 people. And we were not one of those stories. You, I, I meet people and their church went from zero to 75,000 people in three weeks. You know, and I hear those stories and I'm amazed. And that wasn't the journey that the Lord put me on. Um, it, it just wasn't. Uh, for, for the first 12 or 15 years I was there, that there really wasn't a great deal of change in the church. We started with a handful and, you know, we would grow to 100 or so and then it would kind of shuffle again. And I worked 10 years at the church before my salary was current. And I wasn't being paid a great deal of money. Uh, the first 10 years I was there, we didn't even have carpet in the building. I mopped the floor every week. The first three times the sanctuary was painted, I painted it. So I mowed the grass, then I cleaned the bathrooms, and I went to school, and I preached sermons, and I did weddings. And so I, I've been a part of a church at every part of the journey, it seems to me, at least to this point. And, and I can tell you from my vantage point today that there's not a place where I would say I think there's the, there's the perfect church. There are opportunities at every one of those places, and there are challenges all along the way. And I, I, the, the hope I have for our culture and for our nation, and to be completely candid, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the punchline, I think we're in trouble. I think we are in dire trouble. I don't think what we're doing is sustainable. And without dramatic, radical change, I think it's highly probable we lose our freedoms and our liberties. And I don't mean decades from now. I don't think our children and grandchildren will reach my age in life and enjoy the liberties and freedoms that we know today unless the Church of Jesus Christ is awakened to a place that we are not right now. So, and and I'm, I'm an optimist. So I don't say that in any frightening way because I'm a person of tremendous hope. But the hope in the midst of that is the church. And there's a couple of things that I think are challenges for all of us in the church, no matter what size of church or whether you're new or you're a veteran in that place. Um, I, I find two things consistent across the country. I think this is 20 pastors conferences that I have been a part of now in the last 18 months or so. And two things are consistent from Washington and Seattle and Portland and California to New York to Tennessee. Uh, one is we're too divided. Um, and I'll give you my shorthand version of this. If there's a point on which you and I can disagree and we can both still go to heaven, I will extend to you a hand of fellowship. All right, there's a handful of things on which we can't disagree and both still go to heaven. That I won't yield on. The uniqueness of Jesus, the, the incarnation, the virgin birth, um, his physical death on a cross, his burial, his resurrection, can't be negotiated away. It just can't. The authority of the word of God is our rule in faith and practice. It's not open to my addition. Uh, I, I believe I have to submit to its authority even when it's uncomfortable. Having said that, there's a whole myriad of things that are a part of our ministries that are important to us, that define us as unique. The style of music we prefer, the time and the day on which we worship, when and how we receive communion, we can find biblical positions around all of those things, but we could both go to heaven and both be wrong on those points. And if that's the case, I need you. I need to be able to stand with you. Big church, little church. Folks, we got to find a way to work this out. You know, I'm sure our church has gained some participants from other congregations in our community, but I assure you, we have sent hundreds of people from our church to other congregations. I've been there long enough. That's the nature of the beast. People move. Maybe once upon a time, loyalty in church was different. But today, if your teenager has a girlfriend or a boyfriend in another congregation, family's moving. <laughs> and it'll hurt your feelings. Because you may have dedicated that child or done that wedding or been engaged in their lives. But the truth is, we're going to have to find a way to stand together. Not to compromise what we believe but to get over ourselves a little bit on some of the secondary and tertiary things that we've imagined that make us unique. Once upon a time, particularly in the South, when Christianity was still the primary component of the social factor, we could go to church on the weekend. In Murfreesboro, you could find there's a downtown corner where there'll be three or four churches. 
And on Sunday morning, just before 11, because that's when Christians go to church. We'd be filing into our churches, looking across the street, thinking we're better than you. Because the Wesley brothers wrote our hymns. Or because we take communion every time the congregation gathers. Or because we don't have instruments in our building. Or for whatever reason. And I appreciate the luxury of that time and season. And perhaps we will get to return there again. But we're not there right now. We need one another. The other issue is low morale. We're struggling. COVID was a, was a body shot. And it, it wasn't just a pandemic. It wasn't just a medical issue. We're leading in a difficult time to lead. We're watching one of the most precipitous declines of Christian influence in the history of the church. That's just true. Now, God's doing some remarkable things. I can tell you stories, and we've heard some things in here that are truly remarkable. But I have come to the, under, the realization that we have to acknowledge the truth. My father was a veterinarian. You've heard that. So I grew up around medicine. And the beginning of getting healthier when you go to the doctor or you enter any sort of a medical process is an accurate diagnosis. You've got to know the truth about your current condition in order to make decisions about what healthier would look like. And I think we've got to acknowledge that that the influence of Christianity in our culture is in trouble. Now, our adversaries are really anxious to sound the alarm that the church is finished. They discount our boss. So I'm not frightened by that. I think it's a season of amazing opportunity. But I do want to talk a little bit about leading in these seasons of change. The change that is coming at us is unprecedented in both its scope and magnitude and the speed at which it's coming. And those, some of that is technological. Some of that has to do with the fabric of the, the values that have held our society together. It's just, it's difficult to process the things that are coming at us on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. And about the times you think you've negotiated whatever the latest knuckleheaded idea was, knucklehead is a Greek word, <laughs> which if you interpret it means something with which I don't agree. But th those ideas come at us so frequently by the time you reorient yourself and you found a logical response that there are three more ideas down the road. So I want to pause just a minute. I want to read a passage of scripture that I, I suspect most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with. It's from the life of Samuel. Samuel is the last of the judges. And in Christian scholarship, he's an important figure, but he doesn't carry the same significance that he does typically in Jewish scholarship. He's the last of the judges. He's a pivotal character. Following Samuel, the monarchy's established, and Israel takes a completely different direction. And he's led with integrity. His, his, his birth is supernatural. His life is given over to the service of the Lord from the time he was the smallest of a child. And now we find him as an old man in a very difficult place. The tribal leaders gather, and they want to talk to him. I'll read you the passage. It's 1 Samuel 8 and verse 4. All the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to Samuel. And they said to him, you're old. That's the beginning of a great board meeting. <laughs> you're old and your sons don't walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. When they said, give us a king to lead us, it displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. Now, I want to suggest to you that this was an extraordinary, I don't imagine I have the verbal skills to communicate to you the pain that that brings to Samuel. Could we call it rejection? That's what God called it. God said to Samuel, it's not really you they've rejected, it's me. Well, if you go back and read it, they said, Samuel, you're old. You're a lousy parent. And we don't like the direction you've led us all these years. We want to chart a new course. By just about every criteria I know for evaluating your life journey, Samuel's efforts to that point are being called into question. Seem right to you? You're old, you're a lousy parent, and you're a poor leader. And on top of that, you're ugly. I added that. It's not in the text. Okay. Well, I would submit to you that what we have had to deal with since we first heard about a virus might, that might be headed our way from Wuhan, China, 
feels a great deal like rejection. About a third of the people that were worshiping with us at the beginning of 2020 are no longer in our churches. And if you're teaching this word of God, it may be your churches or your ministries have maybe even grown, but I suspect there's been a pretty significant turnover to in the people to whom you're ministering. There's a great deal of change afoot. And the people didn't leave your churches because you were practicing immorality or you were dishonest with the finances and stealing from the budget. They left for issues that were completely beyond our control. But in all the years I've served a congregation, I can't think of any time someone's come to me and said, Pastor, I'm leaving the church. I've decided to be more worldly. I've been thinking of a little adulterous fling, and I don't want to hang around here anymore. I'm going to take a break for a while. It's never happened to me. But I've had lots of people come to me and say, you know, there used to be an anointing here. Or we used to do this, or we liked that, or I used to could park where I wanted to, or now somebody's seated in my chair. Or when the church had a hundred fewer people or a hundred more people or something. And it always felt pretty personal to me. Although well, I sat in the hospital when your kids were sick or I took the appointments when your family was in crisis or whatever it may have looked like. And I would submit to you, Samuel is really at the point of the spirit on a tremendous amount of rejection. And God said to him, Samuel, it's not you they've rejected. It's me. And I, if you'll allow me, I'd like to plant that seed in your heart. What we're walking through is not a re rejection of you and your ministry skills. It's not your preaching style or your leadership style or your parenting. It's not all of those things that people may be bringing to you that's causing this tension that's existing in our culture. It's not just my idea. God said to Samuel, it really isn't you they've rejected. Samuel, it's me. Now, I would also add to that an observation that the most fruitful part of Samuel's life came after the rejection from the tribal leaders. You know the story. God said, Samuel, I want you to anoint a king. I'm going to help him. You tell him what a king will do, but I'll show you to anoint. He anoints Saul. It doesn't work out great. Samuel mourns that. Sure he does. It's the next chapter of his life. It's the next section of his resume. And the man he anointed has fallen from the place that God established him in. But then God sends him to the house of Jesse. And Samuel, the last of the judges, this bridge between the, that period of Israelite history and the establishment of the monarchy, anoints David, a little shepherd kid. Even his brothers overlook him. And he becomes the greatest king Israel will ever know until the Messiah comes. Samuel was given that honor. Now, I don't know what God holds for you. I wouldn't presume to suggest to you that I know the future or that I could prophesy what God will do with your life. But I would submit to you that if you will honor him and continue to walk with him and cooperate with him, that the most fruitful season of your life is before you. Even if your adversaries say you're old or even your friends or that you've been a lousy parent or that your leadership style hasn't been great. None of that seemed to intimidate God. He said, Samuel, we've got work to do. Let's go. And that's what I came to tell you. We've got work to do. Let's go. People left your church, duly noted. Our budget took a hit. Uh-huh. People I've walked with for decades decided not to come back. Okay. Great. Let's get it all out. Write it up. Put it on the table. Let's leave it in this place today. But let's leave here determined to go forward. Let's make the greatest impact for the kingdom of God that our lives have ever seen. Let's see Memphis change. Let's see Memphis lead our nation with a proclamation of the gospel that transforms a community. That is worth the effort. That's worth spending the years of your life on. That's worth the sacrifices that come with serving and leading in a local church or a local church ministry. Now, I want to add to that a suggestion. And it's something that God has made very real in my heart. Rich mentioned it a moment ago. I think we have an assignment. Honestly, I think we have a responsibility to help our communities understand our faith in the light of current culture. I, I had the privilege of having a, a good education. I studied in a variety of places. My undergraduate work was at Oral Roberts University. I did graduate work in theology at Vanderbilt. I attended Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in the Boston area. 
I went to Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Now, if you know anything of those schools, you know Oral Roberts. Vanderbilt's very liberal. Gordon Conwell is very conservative. And Hebrew University is very Jewish. <laughs> so formally, I'm just confused. <laughs> I confess. Okay. But somewhere along the line, that this principle is hammered into all of us is that a text without a context is a pretext, that you have to understand the scripture in the light of the context in which it was written. So you have some expertise on first century culture in the Middle East. You understand the social customs of the days, who the Pharisees were and the Sadducees and the Essenes. And, and probably you have some expertise around what it was like about 10 centuries before the birth of Christ in the ancient Near East, what it looked like to be an ancient Near Eastern monarch when David ascended the throne and what the power and authority that would have come and what those social customs would have been. We were trained in all of those things that we could understand our Bible appropriately. And I believe that's necessary and it's a legitimate educational component. But if you have that and we don't have the courage to take what we know of the word of God and apply it to the 21st century, then we leave our people unprepared for the world in which they live. If a text without a context is a pretext, a text without a current context remains a theory. And our people are not gonna survive with a theoretical faith. It's not enough. Let me choose another arena that's a little simpler. I grew up in the medical arena, so I know a bit about that. Imagine you went to, for surgery at the end of this week, you had a procedure scheduled, and the, 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 you already met with the anesthesiologist and the doctor comes in for that little two minute pre-surgery meeting. And he said, Pastor Allen, I know you lived in Jerusalem. I just want you to know I'm an expert on first century surgical technique. <laughs> I've studied extensively in the ancient languages. I knew Aramaic and Greek. I even know biblical Hebrew. I know what the finest medical practices that were in play when Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem and I'm gonna use them on you today. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm leaving the hospital. I'm pulling out the, the IV and whatever their protocol are, I'm about to break them. Because if I need help, I want the best technology that the 21st century has to offer. Then I would submit to you that we have an assignment to tell biblical truth into our generation to be salt and light for the challenges that our families are facing today. Now, I think I can support that biblically, which would be really good. Let me read Mark chapter 6 and verse 17. It's about an incident between Herod, who's the Jewish governor in Israel, and John the Baptist. Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. And he did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had, had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, John has a very unique comment on his resume. Jesus said, Jesus said, among those born of women, there's no one greater. Jesus didn't say, you know, I wish John could just learn to keep his mouth shut. I wish John would tap the brakes once in a while. He gets a little overzealous and he offends people. There's none of that. In fact, there is nothing in scripture that suggests to us John was off track in any way. You take all our other hero, heroes from scripture, we know some of the flaws and weaknesses and missteps and inconsistencies. We have none of those about John. All we have is Jesus' affirmation. And yet what we can say for certainty from the vantage point of today is John could have lived to have been a much older man if he could have just kept his mouth shut about current events. He could have talked about the miraculous circumstances of his birth and the faith of his father as a priest and what it meant to stand in that priestly tradition and to minister. He could have given the baptism statistics. He could have talked about all the people who left Jerusalem and made the difficult journey to the Jordan River to be baptized and the revival that he saw. He could have focused entirely on that, but he spoke into his culture at a pretty significant cost. Does that sound right? That feels accurate to me. If he would have just avoided current events, I point it out because I think intuitively we understand that as well. If we'll do a polite Bible study, 
around an exegetically correct approach to Luke chapter two. And we'll present it in a homiletically appropriate way with sound hermeneutics as the underpinning. Who could criticize us? It won't bring any division to the congregation unless they just don't like your passage. But if you have the temerity to suggest there's an implication of those passages for the world we live in, if you're willing to say that God ordained marriage, marriage was God's idea before the civil authorities in our nation or any other nation ever underscored them. And then when God imagined that, he said that marriage was between a man and a woman. Then somebody's gonna raise their hand and say, Pastor, you're being political. No, I don't agree. I think I'm being biblical. Now, if I take the other side of the debate, standing in my same pulpit, and I say, well, you know, I think marriage should be expanded a bit. We're in the 21st century now. And the world has changed and the population has grown. I think we should redefine marriage. I agree with that. We should include, you know, anybody you want to put into that arrangement. Then those same voices in those same buildings will raise their hand and say, you're open-minded and you're an advocate for inclusivity. And we understand the division it brings. And oftentimes it causes us heartburn and fear. Again, my dad was a vet. I grew up in a barn. And I still think of the church as a little country church because most of my marks came from that season in the church. But I've helped my father. He was an equine practitioner, but if you were his friend, he would come take care of your cows. And later in life, he didn't want to, if the, the physical demands of large animals was a lot, so he tried to, started treating small animals. So I've helped hundreds of things be born. Calves and foals and puppies and kittens and the occasional gerbil. And to be completely honest, if the veterinarian's out of town and they take your animal into the clinic, his kids are gonna be in on the act. So I've been point on a lot of that. I can tell you I've never helped one of those animals be delivered. And when they ask whether it was male or female, the response was, well, I'm confused. <laughs> no, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. And I can think of few things that would be more tormenting than to be confused about something that is as fundamental as that. I, I don't doubt that it is a point of confusion for many because I think we're witnesses to something that I don't think can be understood as anything other than demonic. You know, it's not enough that we subjected more than 60 million of our children to having their lives terminated while we struggled to find our voice and our adversary said it was political if we said anything. But if we step away and watch our children be mutilated, I'm quite confident God will hold us accountable. Now, I think we have to minister with compassion and love to those who struggle with confusion, whether they're confused about sin, their sexuality. I understand it's an issue for the families in our churches. It's, a, it's an issue for the families on my staff. This isn't something that is removed from us. This is not an us and them discussion. This is a part about our culture. But if we capitulate on the truth because it's awkward, I would submit to you we're no better than a doctor that only likes to give good news. If your personal physician only wants to tell you things that you want to hear, he's neither a friend nor a good doctor. He's committing malpractice. And if we occupy the pulpits and we don't have the courage to speak the truth to the people that we've been called to serve and to love, we're not their friend. We're committing spiritual malpractice. Now, I understand the pressure that brings. In most of our churches, we're employees. There's a presbytery or a board or an elder group or a group of trustees. Someone's called us. They've called pastors before us. They'll call pastors after us. Typically, when I'm asked to speak to pastors, I ask them to bring the, the, the leaders in their churches. Because unless we can stand in unity in those groups, our churches are very easily divided. But we're facing a season where it's going to take courage and boldness and determination and the wisdom of God to continue to lead forward. The church is the conscience of the culture. And if we capitulate, I know what will happen. You'll lose some invitations. You'll be left off some lists. There'll be people that will not want to sit next to you at banquets like these. But I had to come to the conclusion that if the boss is happy, I'm good to go. 
we'll see him one day. Now the answer we're given in most places is that our primary assignment is to be about love. It's somebody stand in our pulpit, not too long ago, within the last few months, and they said out loud to our congregation, Kathy, if things go the wrong way, Kat, my wife is here, Kathy will reach over and put her hand on my leg. That means don't you. <laughs> Whatever she's afraid is about to happen. We have somebody standing in our pulpit and they said to the congregation, I don't read the Old Testament. God's so harsh. And there's a hand on my knee at that point. <laughs> my wife's. <laughs> I read the New Testament because Jesus is all about love. And I like to stay focused on love. And you've heard some variation of that, I'm quite confident. Well, it's, it's worth a moment's consideration. I don't believe that when God finished Malachi, he took a Prozac and then wrote the New Testament. <laughs> I'm of the opinion that if you read the New Testament, God is every much as sovereign and every much as judge of all the earth as he is in any passage in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Have you read the book of Revelation? It sobers me. But I'd like to read a passage from Ephesians chapter 5 that in some ways is a proof text for people that would hold an opinion different than the one I'm sharing with you. And, it, and Ephesians 5 is really a continuation of a thought that begins in chapter 4. Then I'm stepping admittedly into the kind of the middle of the discussion, but I think the heart of the discussion is here. What's preceding it is just underscores what I'll share with you. Paul writes to a church with which he's very familiar. He spent a great deal of time in Ephesus. He helped shepherd that community of faith into existence. They know him well, they know his teaching well, and he knows them well. He's not an itinerant evangelist that's stepping into town for a day. It's people with whom he's done a great deal of life. He's been through public riots with them. I mean, he, he, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that community holds him in high esteem. He writes to them, he says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. M many times we'll stop right there and say, there's the message. It's Jesus' message. Walk in the way of love. Whatever you do, love everybody. It's been a dominant theme. You can go to the bookstores. I, 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 I've, I've written a couple of books. The Christian publishers are much happier if you'll write a happy title. They are. I've argued with them about titles. I, what if we, it's, it's, it's just the truth. They said, yes, but it won't sell. <laughs> I'm, I'm better with the truth. I believe we have an assignment to walk in love. I do with all of my heart. But we need to understand what that means. And we can't allow our current culture to define that. I live in Nashville. If we let country music define love for us, we will miss the kingdom. Right? If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. You may go to the top of the chart with that, but you're not going to go to the head of the kingdom with that. So we need a bit of a biblical insight into what it means to love one another. Well, the very next verse, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, but among you, but's a negative conjunction, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Okay, to the same people that he writes and he says, listen, walk in the way of love. He said, but now amongst you, I've lived with you. We've done life together. I've told you this over and over again. This isn't a new idea, he's saying. He said, there can't even be a hint of sexual immorality, which the implication is God gets to define what's moral and immoral. Not the CDC. Not the American Psychiatric Association. Not the AMA. Not whomever the governing body is that's going to put forth the, the edicts. There can't even be a hint of sexual, no impurity, no greed. They're improper for God's holy people. Now, if he'd stopped there, we're thinking, okay, you know, I can probably make it without sexual immorality. But then he really, he said, there shouldn't be any obscenity or foolish talk or coarse joking. Oh, now he wants to pay attention to my, 
my downtime. They're out of place. But rather thanksgiving, for of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, wait a minute. This is in the same passage that begins. The thesis statement is walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved you. But there can't be a hint of immorality. Because if there is, the immoral or the impure or the greedy they don't have an inheritance in the kingdom. Now, I tell you this because I don't think the problem that is facing us today is the politicians. I don't believe our problem is them. I don't believe the challenges we face are outside the church. I think the greatest determining factor in the future for our children and our grandchildren has to do with the hearts of God's people. If we will humble ourselves and submit once again to the authority of God and embrace a biblical worldview, a Judeo-Christian worldview, however you want to label that, and have the courage to hold that up as the standard of faith and practice in the world in which we live. I understand it's messy because the people we serve, ourselves included, are broken. It's how we got in the door. Jesus didn't lower the standards. You know, people say, well, we're not under the law anymore. I, granted, I believe in grace. I am the post. You look up grace in the heavenly dictionary, my picture's there. I'm right there with Paul amongst those that were sinners. I'm a chief. But by the grace of God, we have been delivered and justified and sanctified. We were given a new future. Jesus said, the law said that if you commit adultery, you're guilty. But I say, if you just look at somebody and you want to commit adultery, you're guilty. Did he raise it or lower it? He raised it. He said, the law says, if you commit murder, you're guilty. But I said, if you're angry enough to want to commit murder, you're guilty. He didn't lower the standard. He raised it. I've often thought it would be interesting if we could have a spiritual detector at the entrances to our church, like we have metal detectors, magnetometers at the entrances to the airport. It doesn't detect metal, it, it, will, it will flash on a screen the condition of your heart. How many of you know we'd have to have church in the parking lot because nobody's walking through that door? Right? I just don't feel called today, Pastor. You know, it's, it's really easy for us to gather our people and explain to them that the problems we have are because of the conditions of the people beyond us. I want to submit to you that if God's people will humble themselves and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, that God will look with mercy upon us. God never handed the Israelites over to an enemy because their enemy had superior military technology. In fact, we find quite the opposite. When the Israelites were outmanned or outgunned or outnumbered, time and time again, God delivered them. But when he did hand them over to their enemies, it was because of the condition of their hearts. People have said to me, ad nauseum, Jesus was not political. He didn't run for office. He didn't throw out the Romans. Now, I agree with you. He did neither of those things. It's an absolutely correct observation. But Jesus is the greatest of all the Hebrew prophets. He's greater than Isaiah and he's greater than Jeremiah both of whom had very different messages. Isaiah's message was the Assyrians are not coming into this city. I don't care how many of them are. Jeremiah said quite the opposite. The Babylonians are coming and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And it had nothing to do with Assyrians or Babylonians. Well, Jesus in that tradition in Luke 19, standing on the Mount of Olives with the city of Jerusalem spread before him began to weep. And he said, the time is coming when your enemies are going to build an embankment against you. And they'll dash the heads of your babies against the stones of this city. You didn't recognize the time of God's coming to you. It wasn't the power of the Roman legions that overwhelmed Jerusalem or the Jewish people. It was the hearts of the people that made them vulnerable to their enemies. Folks, our problem today is not radical Islam 
or communist China or a politician that you don't like. Our problems today is the duplicity in the, our hearts. And for whatever reason, God in his wisdom called you and me to lead in this season. So I want to encourage you. Have the boldness to talk to your folks about the, what the word of God says about what's happening in our world. They are desperate for truth. Truth has fallen in the streets. People don't know what to believe any longer. We can't believe the, C the CDC. We can't believe the FBI. We can't believe the Department of Justice. Let's not let it be said. We can't trust our pastors and our pulpits. It doesn't, the truth isn't always fun any more than learning is always fun. We gotta lose that idea that learning is always fun. There's things we need to learn that are not fun. Self-discipline's not fun. Perseverance is not fun. Overcoming is not fun. But if we don't learn them, we won't make it through the narrow gate. I thank God for you. You are of enormous significance. You have incredible value. It's not the size of your congregation. It's the determination of your faithfulness. You be faithful where you are. God has opportunities prepared for you. I promise that. I have lived that out. I want to pray for you. May I do that? Father, I thank you for these men and women. I thank you for their lives, for every ministry that's represented in this place. Lord, they have prepared themselves and yielded their lives to your service, and they have stood faithfully then I pray now that they would have a wisdom from you far beyond the counsel of any person. Bring a fresh anointing upon their life to see the, the, the persons before them and the opportunities before them from your perspective and not just from their own. Give us understanding. Give us a boldness and a courage. May we have a greater fear of you than any aspect of our current culture or our lives. And I thank you, Father, that we will see a moving of your spirit that exceeds anything that's been a part of our journey to this point. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.